I, last Sunday, if you were here, we talked about Elijah. And uh, in one Sunday, there's no way you can truly talk about Elijah in the sense of across the board. But what, um, I'll tell you something else I need. Uh, Tony, could you hand me that, uh, that scripture sheet right beside you there? I appreciate it very much. Let me just start over here or something, you know. Uh, so, thank you, thanks, Tony. Um, what uh, when we were talking about Elijah, we, we there were some things that just really, really stood out to me. Pastor Greg and I actually over the last um, few weeks, as we've been doing, as I've been doing this God's Great Story series, have been talking about having these conversations about the great stories. And uh, he's kind of hit me up right away, going, "What's the next one? What's the next one?" And so, and uh, so I'll give him. The, the person, he goes and reads the whole context, and he comes back and tries to tell me how to preach a sermon. So, um, no, not really, but we've been having uh, this uh, good exchange going on about it, and he's thrown some good ideas. So he was, we, we got to talking about, because I, I had started noticing this major contrast between Elijah and Elisha, and that they were both powerful prophets of God, but there was this contrast. And, I, and, um, and so uh, I, we got to talking about it. He goes, well, well, are you doing Elisha next after this? And I said, no, that wasn't my plan. And uh, so he kept going, why don't you do it? Because that's such a good comparison and everything. And um, so I kept thinking about it, praying about it. And finally I said, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do I, So I said, yeah, we're going to do Elisha next. So we've inserted Elisha in here into this journey and uh, for good reason. And I think hopefully you'll see that good reason uh, as well. Have your uh, sermon notes beside you or your scripture sheet beside you. Uh, we're going to be grabbing it up and reading it along the way here as we go. Um, if you were to read through the chapters of 2 Kings, uh, you'd see that king after king. Now, these are kings of Israel, kings of Samaria, uh, in, this, in the divided kingdom uh, of, of Israel. You, you would see these kings, king after king. Now, there were exceptions, but generally king after king kept making decisions that were dishonoring to God. And they despised the prophets of God, yet sometimes they would seek them out whenever the crisis became too great. In other words, we've got a problem too big. We've done everything we can do. We're up against a wall. We're between a rock and a hard place. Isn't there a prophet out here someplace? And so they go look this guy up. And, uh, and so as we were talking about this, we were talking about this amazing contrast, as Greg and I were, between two people that God used so greatly, but in different ways. Um, and so today, for a little bit, we're going to study some things about Elisha and his life, and then I'm going to draw some con contrast between the two, just kind of for fun and also to maybe help teach us a couple things with regard to how God works in people's lives. And so look at your sheet with me, if you would, and we're going to begin with a scripture lesson uh, where it's first Kings, the first section up there, 1 Kings 19, 19 21. It says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. Then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, but what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook a meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Some translations say became his assistant, which is probably a better uh, translation of that. He, assist, he, was, he was an assistant to um, Elijah at that point. Now, Elisha was called to be Elijah's assistant, and a couple things happened here. The first read of that story, you would think, well, what are you going to preach about there? This seems like kind of an odd piece of scripture. Um, but hang with me, and maybe there's something God would like to say to you from it. Um, Elisha was called to be Elijah's assistant. Elijah had, Elisha, I'm sorry, had a going away party. He uh, fed his workers. And he got rid of his options. In other words, he's, he's out here. He's, this is how, obviously, he made his living. This is how he fed 
himself and anybody he was responsible for was by plowing up uh, the earth, by farming with his oxen. And uh, since Elijah had invited him to come and follow him and be his assistant, Elisha, he, he, what he did was he, he completely um, annihilated his option of going back and being a farmer. He killed the oxen he had, and he used the plow for firewood. And uh, in, 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 in doing so, he did two things. One was, that was his equipment. That's what he had to work with. So if he's going to be a farmer, he's going to have to save up some more money, go back to buying some equipment, uh, buying some oxen, buying a plow, that kind of thing. And so it's like he took this call so seriously that he actually got rid of an option, any other option. This stuff is not an option to me any longer. I've been called to do this. I'm, I, I, he demonstrated that he was letting go of what he had been doing and how he had been doing it, and he was going to leave now and follow Elisha, Elijah. Boy, their names are awfully close too, aren't they? So if I, if I call the wrong one the wrong name or something, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, try to keep it straight for me, you know? Uh, or go like this, point like this, and that'll really help me, I'm sure. Um, so here he is, a man who already had Elijah's attention, a man who already was showing uh, promise as someone who was a follower of God, who was in, in the realm of, uh, of, of working as a prophet, but he got called away to it being a full-time option then for him, where he burned up everything that was left. I mean, he, he used, uh, for anybody who's an animal lover, just no one understand, he was useful with the oxen. He fed the crew, you know. Um, and so they had a great barbecue. But at that point, he had annihilated his options. Now, the only thing he had to do really was to follow Elijah. Um, let me talk about what this might mean for me or for you. First of all, most people, most people who are following God uh, are not called to vocational ministry. Uh, if, if everybody was called to vocational ministry, uh, there, there would, it, would be, it would be a little bit odd. That's just not, God's, that's not part of God's plan. He does specifically call people, has all throughout time, to vocational ministry. But that's not the call for majority of people. And, um, and, and, and so, so, uh, so I'm not going to apply this only to those who are called to vocational ministry, even though there's something to be said here for this. But I believe that every follower of God has to leave something behind. If you're going to follow God, you will leave something behind. Um, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they were fishermen. And Jesus called them to follow him, and they walked away from their boats, their nets. They walked away from their career, and they began to follow him. Zacchaeus, they were called into vocational ministry. Zacchaeus, whenever Jesus went to his home and ate lunch with him and shared the good news with him, and he received that good news, his calling, or what he left behind, was cheating he left behind cheating. He said, I'll pay back everybody that I've taken from four times as much. And he's also saying, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cheat anybody else. He left behind cheating. The woman caught in adultery, Jesus said, go and sin no more. He's saying, don't go do what you've been doing. This didn't turn out too well, did it? And so he, she had to leave behind adultery. The Pharisees, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and of course all the Pharisees, many of the Pharisees had all these conversations with him, and what Jesus kept telling them they needed to leave behind was dry religion and hypocrisy. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to leave behind this hypocrisy, this, this religion. The woman at the well, whenever she answered him, she gave kind of what we call an indirect answer. I can't say she, was, she wasn't lying, but she definitely wasn't revealing everything. And in the midst of that, Jesus went ahead and told her everything she'd ever done. And so she goes back in the town, and so she, she, she gave up covering up anything in her life. She, she welcomed transparency. 
She went back in the town and said, hey, guys, I just need to tell you something. This guy out here literally told me everything I've ever done, and some of you know that's not so cool. So, I mean, he knew it. He already knew it. So she gave up false impressions, trying to look better than they were. The rich young ruler, Jesus called him to give up his pride and his greed. Jesus, he said, anyone who will try to stop you from doing God's will, in, uh, in Matthew chapter, in chapter uh, 12, verses 48 and 50, and if you just hang with me a second, it's not on your sheet, but uh, let me, let me um, just share it with you. He said, who, they were saying, your mother and your brothers are outside, they want to speak to you. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, he wasn't saying disown your parents. He just simply was saying this. And that is that sometimes you have to walk away from the naysayers in your life. You have to go forward even when other people tell you to stop. You have to do what is right even whenever someone else is against it whether that be a family member or whether that be a best friend or anything else, you have to choose, am I going to have my allegiance to Christ or is my allegiance just to my, my family alone? And there's nothing wrong with having allegiance to your family, but, we, but, but sometimes a family will misguide us. And Jesus also told us something that we could leave behind. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 30, we could leave our burdens behind. He made that great invitation he says, come to me, all you who, who labor and heavy laden, and uh, uh, take my yoke upon me, learn of me, you'll find rest to your souls. Um, and so Jesus invited everybody to leave behind their problems, their burdens, their doubts, their fears, their concerns, their, their troubles. And I want to ask you this question. What has God asked you to let go of? that you're still holding on to. I'm, I'm going to read a list. I, I kind of don't like reading lists because I always, you're going to leave something out and understand if I leave something out, God's Spirit will faithfully bring it to your mind and your heart. So just you listen to him. I'm not trying to play the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to prompt your thinking mode here. So what has God asked you to let go of that you're holding on to? An image a habit, a grudge, unforgiveness, a relationship, anger, lust, hypocrisy, gossip, fear, insecurity, pride, addiction, greed. Now, we could go on and on. The list could go on and on. I'm not here to try to point out everything that anybody might struggle with. I'm just here to say, I believe that if we're going to truly be followers of God, there'll be something we leave behind. Can you think with me today about something that you've left behind? One of these patterns of behavior, one of these character defects, one of these areas of, of besetting sin. Is there something in your life that you've left behind? And, and, and that's awesome. We can celebrate that. But the question today would be, is there anything that God is asking you to leave behind? See, Elisha, in that moment, whenever that call was clear to him and he was deeply aware that God was calling him to, to quit what he was doing and to go and follow, he burned up his options. Now, I'm not saying you have to have a go bon get a bonfire or something like that. But what you do have to do, if God says doing that or being a part of that or, ha or, or having that habit, having that attitude, having that whatever it is, is going to hinder you from being able to follow me appropriately, the question is, are you willing to leave it behind and follow? That's something we see about the character of Elisha that I think set him up to be an amazing prophet of the living God. He burned up his plow. He didn't just burn it up. He used it for firewood to actually put on a big barbecue for all the other workers. 
He left them with a good taste in their mouth, so to speak, as he was leaving. He didn't leave on bad terms. He left on good terms. He didn't say, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like what I'm doing here. I don't like you guys. I don't like anything. He didn't leave with a bad attitude. He left in favor with those he was leaving. But he left, and he left it all behind. And he followed the man of God and became a terrific assistant to him and beyond, which you'll see. Now, if you would look at the next section of Scripture, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. This, again, might seem like, an, you know, like a little bit of a unique Scripture. Hang with me. Let's roll through this and try to concentrate as best you can. I want you to turn to somebody before you do and say, leave something behind. Okay? Could you do that? If you, know, if you don't know somebody well enough, then just say hi to them or something. You know? But leave something behind. You know, please don't miss that. You know, you, know, you, know what, you know what I keep finding out in my life? Things keep showing up in my life that God says to me, you better leave that behind. You say, well, Rod, you've been walking with God for a long time, haven't you? I have. And guess what? There still keeps appearing things on my radar that God's going, you better leave that behind. Why don't you go ahead and leave that behind? So let's make sure we don't miss that, okay? Let's go on to the next scripture. And this is, this is uh, found in, in 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. Well, he was called to be Elijah's assistant. In his mind... There was no point. There was no point to leave him alone. He was going to follow him. He's going to be with me. He's going, no, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I'm not leaving you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets of Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord's going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha said, so be quiet. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I there was one translation I was reading that said, Shut up. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, I mean, the Bible, that's one thing I love about the Bible. The Bible just says it like it is. I, I was reading a sort of background scripture this morning, just getting that bigger, broader picture, and I was like, I just sat there and was laughing over some of that stuff. This is crazy. He said, be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. I mean, this guy, is, he's covering all of his bases before God takes him out, you know, to heaven. And he replied, as sure as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Here it is again. Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. He replied, as surely as the Lord lives, as you live, I will not leave. So the two then walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? He said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, let's just pause here a minute. Elijah, if you were just to look across, read the whole Bible and look for the name Elijah and see how many times it comes up, it appears quite a bit throughout the whole Bible, not just in his time era of living. He was a person referred to a lot. Elijah was truly a mouthpiece for God. He was powerful. He exhibited great demonstrations of power, of God's power. He was a person God used, to, as we talked about last week, just to bring the fire right down from heaven and consume that. He took out hundreds of false prophets. I mean, this, this was a guy who, who was bold as a lion, so to speak. And many times he's, he's kind of seen as like in the Old Testament, the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. More and more, as I get to study in and see about Elisha, Elisha seems to demonstrate maybe even a little bit more of the spirit of Christ in the sense. And so there's this interesting correlations here that you can see in these two guys' lives. And so here Elisha is going, man, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And you're going, man, this guy is going to inherit, he's going to invent the atomic bomb. You know, I mean, he is like going to blow the whole place up. I mean, Elijah, you know, he he blew up that that altar where the where the where, where the when the prophets of Baal and everything they couldn't call anything down, and fire came out of heaven. I mean, he just he just did it. He 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 actually became God's weatherman. 
he told the king, right up to the king's face, it will not rain, if you remember last week. It will not rain until I say it rains. I mean, I, God put me in control of the weather. It's not going to rain until I say it rains. You're telling the king that, the guy who can take your you know, head off. And so, I mean, this was a bold, bold man. So you're going, man, if, if Elisha gets a double portion of his spirit, we have no clue what would happen. Okay, but go on. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. And so we're walking along, talking together. Suddenly, a chariot of fire and horses. A fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. You'll see that expression throughout this whole section of Scripture, even from other people. So it must have been a common saying of that time. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood in the bank of Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now was the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Now, this, you have to, if you don't, you know, if you want to have some great reading this week, just read the two book, the two books of Kings, you know, because it is amazing. Because there, there is this is fantastic stories, and we can only do parts of it here. But let's just talk about some some concepts that we might gain from this passage we just read. And and let me say this first of all: who you hang out with has a lot to do with the direction your life will take. Who you hang out with has a lot to do with the direction your life will take. Just even the fact that you're here this morning and, uh, and hanging out with this set of people, it, it, believe it or not, it actually has a pretty strong bearing on the direction of your life. And so you want to be very careful about who you associate with, who you hang out with, who you rub shoulders with, who you, who you kind of do life with. Because Elisha, out here plowing in the field, Elijah comes, puts his cloak on him, invites him to be his assistant. He burns up his stuff, he follows, and then he becomes so committed that he's there even when Elijah is taken up into heaven, the chariot of fire. And at that moment, all of a sudden, He's received this double portion that God had given to Elijah. And it's recognized immediately by the other prophets that he is the person who's the lead man, God's lead man on this earth. Now, I'd like to ask you this question. How easily distracted or discouraged are you from following through on your commitments? See, Elisha was called to be Elijah's assistant. And whatever reason, Elijah kept saying to him, hey, I'm going here, why don't you stay here? You know, I don't know whether, you know, Elisha had a sore foot or, you know, he just thought, well, he's not as fit as I am or, you know, or, or you know, I, uh, he's going to be jealous. At, you know, God seems like God's going to take me to heaven in some unique way here. Whether he thought, you know, I don't know what he thought, but he just kept inviting Elisha to stay put. And Elisha's like, hey, if God's alive and you're alive, I'm with you. I mean, you could, he couldn't get rid of him. And, and, and I, I just have to say, there's something about somebody who's not easily distracted or easily discouraged from doing what it is that God's asked him to do. And, and it's so easy for us to get our eyes off of, get our sight off of what it is God's called us to do. Because, and, and then I think it's one of the reasons why oftentimes we fantasize about how God wants to use us. We fantasize that God wants us to do something massive for him. You know, there's an individual over a fairly lengthy period of time in my life who has consistently told me God has something really big for them to do, really big. They've, they've, they've consistently told me that it involves thousands and thousands of people in arena. Now, the, I, don't, I, don't, I do what Matt... Um, the guy out at Los Angeles, we showed his video here one day, and some of you weren't here, but he, he, said, he said his dad always told him that if someone tells you that they're going to do something and you're not so sure that's really what God may have for me to do, you just say, well, praise the Lord. So, 
and I, I, so really when this person has told me this many times over the years, I kind of just gone, you know, I don't know. I'm not, but I was just, so I just say, you know, well, praise the Lord in a certain kind of way or another, you know, it's just like, I, I'm not going to discourage them. I'm not going to, but best I can tell, I can't even see one person that that person has helped or led someplace. In fact, what I notice is they're having a hard time leading themselves. And so I'm not going to say that God's not going to do something great in front of thousands of people with them. That's up to God. But my suspicion is that sometimes we escape to something we think is great that God wants us to do, and we neglect the task at hand. I just have a word to say to you moms who have little children. Some days I know you feel like you're going backward rather than forward. Some days you feel overwhelmed. Some days you feel overcome. Some days you feel like it's too hard of a job to do and you just can't do it. But I want to tell you that is a job God's given you to do. And if he's given it to you to do, you can do it. Now, when I say that, I don't mean it's not hard. I don't mean that at all. And, and, and I, I want to say to dads, dads, he's given you a job to do. He's given me a job to do as a father. And that job is hard. And, 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 it's, and, it, and it requires a lot from us. And sometimes, sometimes we excuse ourselves from a lot of the interaction with the children that we need to have based on the fact that maybe we're the breadwinner. Maybe, maybe, maybe we, we feel like we're bringing them a bigger slice, slice of the loaf. It's not always true, but if that's true, then sometimes we go, well, I provide for my family. I really, I'm a good provider. I take care of my family. But what about the emotional needs of your children? What about the spiritual needs of your children? What about, I'm not fussing at you. I'm just simply saying, don't put down the job God has in front of you. Because it looked like to me that Elisha was just like trying along behind Elijah. Like Elijah's going, hey, you can stay here. Maybe you could write a sermon or two. Stay back here and write a sermon or two. Do something. You know, you don't have to go over here with me to Jericho. And Elisha's like, well, that's my job. Be your assistant. I'm going to, wherever you're going, I'm going. Whatever I'm, so what he was supposed to do is what he did. So my question is, forget about that grand glorious thing God's going to have you do sometime. What does he want you to do today? What's in front of you right now? What's, 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 what's he asking you to do? What is your role? What is your, what is your responsibility? What's the responsibility right in front of you right now? That's what God wants you to be doing. And Elisha had that sense of, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And he was doing it. He didn't get distracted. He didn't, let, he didn't even let the guy he was trying to help with his whole heart discourage him from going. He's going, as long as God's alive and you're alive, I'm with you. I mean, it was just simple to him. I'm doing what I've been called to do. So instead of avoiding what we're called to do, let's embrace what we're called to do. And if God wants you to do something great and marvelous and Billy Graham style, stadium style, guess what? It'll be because you were faithful in the small things. See, Elisha, you would go, he became this great, and we're going to talk about a couple of great things he did. He became this great prophet with a double portion of Elijah's spirit. But it looks like at this point, he's just like, wherever he goes, I'm going. Wherever he goes, I'm going. I mean, it's just like he's just like this little kid following around this great prophet, Elijah. But he was doing what he was supposed to do. Elijah told Elisha, and these are a bunch of Elijah and Elisha in here, so listen carefully, okay? Elijah told Elisha after Elisha had already insisted to stay with Elijah that he had to see him taken in order to get that to get that double portion. Now, they didn't have that conversation whenever Elisha was going, no, nope, you're going, I'm going. Your God's alive, you're alive, I'm going. They didn't have that conversation until later. Because it was after all that, then Elijah said, what can I do for you before the Lord takes me? And he made that request. See, commitment doesn't come after we know the end result. Commitment comes when we're not sure what the end result will be. True commitment isn't based on I know exactly what I'm going to get. I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. You might want to know that in a business deal as best you can or something else. But I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. We live by faith. And faith requires that we don't always know the outcome. What we know is what we're supposed to do. Elisha did not know that Elijah was going to ask him this question. 
He did not know that Elijah was going to say, you have to be present in order to receive what I offer. He didn't know that. But out of his commitment to do what was in front of him, what his job was to do, he followed him and he was with him and that discussion occurred. So many times we get the cart before the horse. We want God to, to fulfill all of his promises. And then if you do this, I'll do this. We're bargaining with God all the time. If you'll do this, I'll do this. If you'll do this, I'll do that. If you will, and, and, and God's like, God, God isn't really into that kind of bargaining. What he's saying is do what you're supposed to do right now. And trust me that I won't leave you hanging. Trust me, you'll have a better deal at the end than what you could have imagined or thought. Elisha did what he was supposed to be doing. In the midst of that, Elijah said, well, since you're still traveling here with me, you know, is there anything I can do with you before I head on to heaven? He said, yeah, double portion. Now, he's already made all these commitments to be with him, and Elijah says, you gotta be with me when it happens. That's not a problem. Elisha already made that commitment. Surely as the Lord lives, surely as you live, I'll be here. I'm not, I'm not going anyplace. I'm going to be here with you. He'd already made that commitment. So it wasn't a new commitment to him. He'd already made it. What commitments does God want you to make to him? See, we can't, you just, you know, always, it sounds like I'm harping on this. I don't ever want to harp on it. It's just a good example. So many times we'll say, well, if God, if I, you know, I've heard people say, well, if I ever win the lottery, man, I'll, I'll build your next building out here. Well, that's great. If you win the lottery, help us build the building. Some people say, well, you can't do that. That's the devil's money. I'm going to tell you this much. I'll put the devil's money to real good juice. You go ahead and give it. You go ahead and bring it in here. We'll build buildings. We'll do stuff. We'll do ministry. I don't, I, that's okay. I'm all right with that. But, but here's what I'm going to tell you. If we wait around for that, what we're doing is we're skirting our own personal responsibility. See, what we do is we make a commitment to do what God says to do. You know, we, if we wait to tithe until we have enough money, you'll never tithe because you'll never have enough money. But if you tithe and obey God, the reality is that somewhere along the way, I can't tell you what day and where it is and everything else, the reality is you'll find yourself living by principles that will end up benefiting you in ways you have a hard time imagining today if, if, if you're not already in that obedience. Elisha's priorities were right. My job is to assist this man, and I'm going to assist him. I'm going where he goes. I'm doing what he does. That's what I'm doing. Elisha's follow-through was good. He persevered. And I just want to ask this morning, just ask, what is it that is in front of you? What is it that's on your plate to do? What is it that's a part of your world? Now, I'm not saying everything that's on your plate needs to be on your plate. What you might need to do is take some of those things on the plate and, let's say it together, leave them behind. Can we say that together? Leave them behind. So you might need to take some things off your plate and leave them behind. Because everything you leave behind doesn't have to be a sin. It might be a good thing that's killing you for something better. So leave behind some stuff. Burn it. Make a barbecue. Have a great celebration when you tell it goodbye. But move on. Make sure you persevere with the things that God has put on your plate that you know are God task. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 11. I'm going to tell you, I'll have to do these stories here real fast, but they're funny as all get out to me. I'm, I, I just am telling you, they're funny to me. Um, and, and, and I'm not giving you the whole story, I'm just giving you a piece of it. And we've looked at it before, so it's not like this is the first time you've maybe ever heard it if you've been here. This is where Naaman had leprosy. He was a commander of, uh, of, of, of a, a, a foreign nation outside of Israel that often fought with Israel, but he was a, he was a commander of their army. He's a powerful man. He was actually a very, very powerful man, very well respected in his kingdom, but he had leprosy. There was a little Israelite girl who was, in, who, was a, who, who was a servant in his household, and she told him that there was a prophet in Israel that could heal him. So he goes, it's a big story, he goes to the king first, then he comes down here to Elisha. Remember, we're talking about Elisha now, because Elijah's gone to heaven. Elisha. He comes down to Elisha. And so here's where we pick it up. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Now remember, he's in, he has chariots and horses. He's like next to the king in command. He's the, he's the, he's a, he's the head general. He's the chief general of, of, of the army. And he pulls up in front of Naaman's, uh, in front of Elisha's house. And here's what Elisha sent a messenger 
I want you, you got to hear this. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him. Now, he's right out in his front yard. He's right out on the street there. Elisha's in his lazy boy having his devotions or something. I don't know what he's doing. Whether he's a clicker. I don't know what. But he's sitting there in his lazy boy, and he goes, hey, hey, uh, Jake, get out the door there and just tell this guy. Here's what you tell him. And so he says, he told him this. He said, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. That is good news for this guy, right? Wrong. Because when you're important, you're important, okay? I don't care if you have leprosy or not. Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Wow. Now, what you know happened is Naaman's officers with him finally said, look, if he told you to go here and go there and do it, you'd do it? Just because you think the Jordan's a muddy old river and everything else? You're not going to do it? I mean, what if it works? So finally he went and did it. And boy, you talk about a turnaround in attitude. This guy comes back like, man, you guys are the greatest. But what killed him was that this prophet wouldn't get up out of his lazy boy and come out and do some magical waving over his spot and God help me you know, do this like call down fire from heaven. He didn't know about Elijah, but Elisha knew about Elijah. Elisha had a double portion. And you know what Elisha did? Sat in this lazy boy. Hey, Jake, go out and tell him to go dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman's out here so insulting. Look at the royal gown I have on. Look who I am. Look at all of my medals. I mean, you think those Americans have a lot of medals on there. I mean, look, we're... We're better than North Korea. I mean, anyway, I'm just sorry. But I mean, like, I mean, he got medals, man. Medals. He's like, and that dude never even came. He sent his servant out here. Tell me. And, and that money, Jordan. See, Elisha, he, he's just like, he was calm. He was cool. He was collect. Like, hey, tell him to go do it. See, Elisha was not impressed with cool people. Elisha was impressed with God. We, we, live, we live in, what's, what are, what are, what's the um, American idol? Idol? Great, great name for. I'm a good show or whatever, even. I mean, great people have come through it or whatever, have been great singers. But it symbolizes something about us. We idolize God. People. So Joe Cool, commander in chief, comes rolling up here in his chariots. And Elisha, can you bring me another glass of tea? Go tell him whatever. This guy's like, You've got to be kidding me. Man, I am important. See, Elisha was not impressed with cool people, he was impressed with God. And I would say, if there's any statement that may define, Elisha in his ministry was that it's kind of that statement. Elisha was not a prophet for personal gain. He, he the guy tried to give him all this stuff. He didn't take it. And his servant, that's another story. Uh, you can read that and get the, get the, what his servant did. But Elisha did not receive gifts, so there could be no thought that God's power was up for sale. He wanted it very clear. He wasn't trying to get any glory. He wasn't trying to go, well, I did this great here. He wasn't trying to, he, he, some televangelists would do good to read that story too, I think. But anyway, um, it's a passing thought. Uh, I can see it didn't go over too well either. So sorry if I insulted your love for televangelists. But um, see, Elisha wanted Naaman to be impressed with God, not Elisha. He didn't want that important man to go back and think that because of his importance that God was impressed. He didn't want that man to go back and think that because Elisha was so powerful that he would be impressed. He wanted that man to go back and go, boy, that God of that guy, the God of that guy is something else. In fact, if you read the whole story, you'll see how that happened. Now, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11, 13 says this. This is another quick story. This enraged the king of Aram because they, what was happening is the king of Aram was going and attacking Israel, but every time they went, Israel was there waiting for him. And so here's what he said. He said, 
This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. In other words, who's the narc in here? None of us, my lord the king, said one of the officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, did you hear that? In other words, the words this man speaks in private, the, 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 the prophet is telling the king of Israel, so the king of Israel knows exactly what his next move is. Now listen to what this dumb king says. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. Let me me ask you a question. If what the guy said was true, that this prophet knows what he says in private, is he sitting here thinking, this guy will never know I'm coming to get him. Uh, He doesn't have a clue that I'm coming to get him. What was he thinking? You know, let me ask you, do you ever think you can outwit God? I mean, really, I mean, I know you go, oh, no, I never think that. But do you ever act like you're outwitting God? Do your ever actions ever demonstrate that you're trying to outwit God? Do you ever think you can control God? You know, I'll just keep him over here, and I'll do this all over here, but I'll just keep him over there, like you can control him. Do you think you can keep God out of your private thoughts, and, and that he doesn't know what's going on inside of you? Do you think that? You know, I, I, there was a song, and I don't know the song well, but I've heard it a couple times, a country song, that uh, about a, the best the line I remember is, this guy took a girl on a date or something like that, and his dad, did, uh, his, the dad, girl's dad had said something about come back at a certain time, and he didn't, he came back hours later, and he pulled up, and the dad was sitting there with a shotgun, and the line that keeps going through the song is this, what was I thinking? Well, what was I thinking? You know, everything was, what was I thinking? Because everything he was doing was stupid. So what was he thinking? What was he thinking? I'm thinking this king could have written that song. What was I thinking? You know, I mean, I mean, here it is. They tell me the king, this, this prophet knows exactly what I'm saying. But I tell you what, anyway, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but let's go down. Let's find out where he is. Let's go get him. You didn't hear that? What were you thinking? Anyway, so he sends his, he sends his army to go get the prophet. And you know what the prophet did? Prophet asked God to blind him. Never ruffled a feather with this prophet. His, his servant was ruffled, but he wasn't. He, 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 he went out and he led him all the way into the city where the king was. And there, this is what happens. Look at, look at verse, um, uh, verse 21. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Sound like he wanted to, asked him twice. Do not kill them, Elisha answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. This is a guy who got a double portion of Elijah. Elijah's like, everybody stand back, calling fire down from heaven. We're going to blast them right here. We'll show them who God is. And Elijah, double portion, he's going, uh, no, I don't kill him. Why don't you feed him? Feed him and send him back home. What an amazing contrast. It's like to me, here, here's, so you go, well, so what are we supposed to learn from this, from a standpoint of this contrast? Well, God uses different people in different ways. And, and, and Elijah was this one, he's going to demonstrate God's power in powerful ways. Now, he seemed very comfortable in that. Then he'd get over here by himself, and he's sort of like a little whimpering puppy dog, like, oh, God, they're going to kill me all. They're gonna, I'm all by myself, you know? He'd get all scared. Out there, put him out there against the king, you know, face to face. He's going, huh, you defy the God, boom. I mean, it's, and, and if you don't believe me, and I don't have to, I'm not going to have time to get to it, I can tell you, read the first chapter of 2 Kings. I had forgotten about this. He calls down fire and blasts two units from the king that came out there who would send them to him and, and, and called fire from heaven down. I mean, it's like he loved to bring that fire from heaven down, like going, boom. And the third guy that came out, he's crawling up to him going, please spare me. I see those piles of ashes over there. Please spare me. And anyway, that's a story. You've got to read it. It's just it's, it's, it's amazing. So Elijah stays entirely unruffled when he faced an entire army. 
He leads them to their enemy king. He prayed so they could see. Surprise, surprise. Your enemy king's right in front of you here now. Then Elisha says, feed them and send them home. And they left Israel alone after that. Amazing. See, I have to read this last section of verses for you because this is, this is like one of these greatly humorous passages to me. I mean, you guys, you guys know, I know you guys think I have weird sense of humor, but I'm sorry. Look at this. I forgot this was in here too. 2 Kings chapter 13. Elisha died and was buried. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw the band of the raiders. They threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood on his feet. Say, hey man, I went to your funeral. What are you doing here? Hey, they threw me in Elisha's grave. I hid his bones and look, here I am, you know? I mean, what you're talking about, you think of resurrection only happened in the New Testament. I mean, resurrection happened several times in the Old Testament. This guy is standing because he bumped into his bones. See, God's power was so pervasive in Elisha that when a dead man touches bones, he sprang to life. I have a question for you. What kind of impact do we have on those who are spiritually dead when they bump into us? You say, Rod, that's a bad question to close this thing out with, isn't it? I'm not going to quite close it out with it, but here's the last Elijah, he would go and confront. Elisha was a person people came to. Elisha called down fire. Elisha calmly put out fires. Elijah lived on the edge of the culture. Elisha lived in the culture. Elijah was bold and scared. Elisha was steady and consistent. Elijah killed the false prophets. Elisha fed the enemy and sent them home. Elijah had a powerful spirit. Elisha had a double portion of that spirit. Elijah was outspoken. Elisha was meek. He had great power under great control. 